It is good to see you today. You know, based off of our uh, board over here, it looks like 150 people uh, didn't set their clocks forward, right? Yeah. I'm glad you laughed. That was awful. I know it was bad. Uh, I'm pretty sure daylight si saving time jokes are, are dead now, and that's okay. But, uh, you know, last week we did, we finished our beginning series on, on the first half of the book of Genesis because we had Bible Bowl last week, and we kind of culminated that with the visiting congregations. Um, but even though Bible Bowl is now done, and our kids did very well, mind you, our, kid, uh, we're not, our kids are not quite done with the book of Genesis. They're still going to be working on those first 25 chapters as they prepare for LTC until Easter. And they're going to be making puppet shows and skits and speeches and more from these texts as they continue to grow stronger as Christians and stronger as leaders in our church. And we're very proud of our young people for doing that and thankful for our volunteers who head that up. But I'm afraid that we are going to be moving on from the sermon series of Genesis into a new one on the book of Romans. And the reason for this, this new series being done so quickly, I'll admit, it's not some big theological shift. It's not out of divine inspiration. It's the fact that my epistles class in school is going over Romans right now. So, hey, we're going to go over Romans. You know, after five semesters of grad work, it finally hit me that maybe when I spend all week studying certain texts for school, I should just turn around and preach on those texts that I'm, I'm, I'm spending so much time on. And so you have it. We have um, Romans for the next handful of weeks. But if I'm going to be honest with y'all, I'm pretty intimidated to preach through the book of Romans. You know, outside of the book of Revelation, Romans is probably the most debated and controversial book in the entire Bible, let alone the New Testament. Every commentary or study resource you pick up about Romans has a different idea about what Paul is trying to say in this incredible Incredible letter. You know, Paul packs so much into every sentence of this letter that it, it turns out to be dense and, and easily misunderstood. Uh, and that's why I had Wyatt, which he did a fantastic job, I had Wyatt read the scripture this morning that he did uh, from Second Peter. Because it lets me feel better to know that even Peter, when writing to other Christians, was like, hey, Paul's stuff is important, but it's pretty hard to understand. And if Peter felt that way, it makes me feel a little better about that as well. You know, by this point, you might know well enough that I would rather preach a six-week series on Leviticus uh, than uh, general epistles. But, you know, if you allow your preacher that uh, vulnerability of intimidation by such a uh, dense and important book, I, I also want you to know how excited I am to be jumping into this text with you. You know, Paul's words here are some of the most important for understanding what it means to be a Christian to be saved, to be the people of God. It is so important. And I hope that these truths would bless your life over the next couple months, as I know it will be mine. But when I say that, I think to me, the, the book of Romans is, is summed up best by saying that it is about the righteousness of God. Okay, the righteousness of God. That is actually what I've titled our series, and it's a line that's used throughout the entire letter. Paul will write the righteousness of God over and over again. Uh, but it's, once again, never quite that simple. Even that line itself is one of these debated things when people study the book of Romans. You know, what is the righteousness of God? Is it the righteousness from God, the righteousness that he gives to us that makes us saved? Or is it literally the righteousness of God, the fact that God himself is just and is righteous. Uh, and being a good millennial, I kind of think it's both, <laughs> all right? Um, you know, the righteousness of God shows us that he is true to his promises, that he is righteous and sets all things right in the world. And as a part of that greater redemption, we received the gift of righteousness from God. And I hope that can frame your thoughts for the next handful of weeks, that God is righteous even when the world around us may have us questioning if that's true. And that we are also righteous in Christ because of the sacrifice that he's given us. And, and so with that footing, I want us to go ahead and jump into Paul's most famous letter, the book of Romans, starting in chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Paul writes, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain for them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools." 
and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and animals and birds and reptiles. You know, I think we can easily say that Paul comes out pretty strong, right, in this letter. This is a letter to a church that he has never visited before, and he comes out pretty strong right away. He takes no time at all bringing up that God's wrath is coming. God's wrath is coming to address wickedness. And that might surprise us a bit, but I don't, I don't think it necessarily should, okay? Paul knows, as do we, right, that to fully appreciate the good news, we oftentimes need to understand the severity of the bad news. Amen. Haven't you found that to be true? To truly embrace the good news, we have to understand the severity of the bad news. And it's no surprise, or it shouldn't be any surprise to any of us, that the world has devolved into darkness and wickedness. And why shouldn't we consider the wrath of God coming to address the evilness that exists so prevalently in our world? And let's just, I guess, let's just pause on this concept for a moment and consider, how do we feel about the wrath of God? How do we feel about the wrath of God? Usually the simple answer is not good, okay? Uh, you know, we, we like to be comfortable. We like our image of a graceful shepherd more than the image of a wrathful God. And while I, I cannot emphasize enough that those two images should not be mutually exclusive, okay, I think that they inform each other. A God that has wrath against evil and a God who has grace and is shepherding and pastoral, those are two images I think go hand in hand. And man, Andy, uh, your, your communion comments this morning could not have set this up better, the idea of a grieving God against evil in the world and, and then the wrath of a God against evil in the world go hand in hand. Um, you know, but I want us to consider that the possibility that the wrath of God is not something to shy away from, not necessarily. You know, it's not a bad thing. Even if it feels a bit uncomfortable at times, the wrath of God in one aspect or another is, is an aspect of his nature that we should bring praise to him because of. We should praise God because of his wrath if we trust that he is truly a good God. Now, allow me to reframe this for, for just a second, okay? The early Christians who heard these words from Paul, who read this letter to the Romans, when he wrote about the wrath of God being revealed against wickedness, do you know what they heard? Justice. When they heard about the wrath of God coming against wickedness, they heard a message of justice. Remember, these early Christians, they were being tortured. They were being tortured and killed solely because of their beliefs. They were some of the best citizens that Rome had, and yet they were being brutally slaughtered because they claimed that Jesus was the Christ, the anointed one of God. Christian children were tossed to lions and tigers to be pulled apart in front of spectators. Neighbors were burned alive, and, and so much worse. So when they heard that God's wrath was being opened up, their response was to rejoice. That was good news to them because they knew that evil, true and genuine evil in the world was finally being addressed, was finally being dealt justice. Do you see how in their eyes the wrath of God can be viewed as a positive thing? Do you see that? And I don't think that's just contained to their era either. How do you think the early American slaves would have felt about God's wrath descending on the wicked? How do you think Ukrainian mothers right now would feel about God's wrath descending on the wicked? And when we remember that there is very real evil in this world, and when we remember that there is very real oppression and abuse, then the wrath of God does not sound so bad, does not sound so much like a negative thing. Now, we have been blessed haven't we? We have been blessed in this segment of the world, in this segment of time, that we have lived in a great deal of privilege. So that when we talk about wrath, it's easy for us to uh, forget that there are things to be wrathful towards, right? Because we have not had to experience a lot of that. We have not had to experience what other people have had to experience, and it's easy for us to forget that there are things to be wrathful towards. You know, I know a, a handful of people who have walked away from Christianity because they didn't like this image of a wrathful God. And to an extent, I understand that. I have seen how this image has been used and abused in a, in, a, in a less healthy way in the past. But when I encounter those people who have walked away from Christianity because of this image of a wrathful God, I like to challenge them by asking them their thoughts on Hitler. I've yet to meet a fan, okay? I've yet to meet a fan, but it turns out most people are actually for a bit of wrathful vindication when we give the right example. You know, I find that even though they don't like 
the image of a wrathful God, they like less an image of a God who lets Hitler off scot-free, who rewards Hitler with, uh, with heaven, who doesn't care about the genocide of thousands and thousands of people. They might not like the image of a wrathful God, but they like that image even less. It turns out the wrathfulness of God against evil is, like I said, just one more reason for us to stop and to praise him. Okay? You know, and then the problem becomes then that we, you and I, we want to be the judges of what's evil and what's not. What's deserving of God's wrath and what's not. What's wicked and what's not. You know, Hitler should be judged, sure, but my gossiping isn't, isn't really all that bad. You know? Slave drivers deserve wrath, sure, but God should just leave my pornography addiction alone. And here's the great thing about Christianity. God is the judge, Amen. not you. God is the judge, not you. God has set forth what is righteous and what is unrighteous. And we do not get to pick and choose which is which. Now that might sound a, a, bit, a bit harsh, you know, a bit old school from your 28-year-old uh, preacher. But it's, it's part of the greater gospel message that I've committed to teach, that we have all committed to live by. Now, with that said, I can't help but remind you that, that Romans is Paul writing this very detailed argument, and every single bit of Romans builds on its other. And the, the bad news that we're talking about this morning is building up to that section of good news, that we do have forgiveness from those sins, and we do have safety in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is the broader message. But this truth, this wrath of God, still remains truth. And if you'll allow me just one other small rabbit trail before we continue on this morning, because I, I don't get the opportunity to, to point, out this, point this out enough. You know, I said God chooses what is righteous and what is unrighteous, and we do not get to choose that. And I, got, I saw a head full of uh, heads nodding in the crowd, and, and this might get a little bit less heads nodding in the crowd. But not only is God the one who decides what is wicked, but he is also the only one qualified enough to punish it, okay? He's the only one qualified enough to punish that wickedness. Time and time again, the Bible gives us these positive examples of men and women of the faith who choose not to seek revenge, who choose not to play God, who choose not to be the divine judge, and they let God handle the wicked. They let God handle judgment. Now, I'm sure the uh, implications of that are probably running amok in your brain. If they're not, they should be, okay? It's good. We, we need to be challenged sometimes of what we assume in, in this world. Uh, and I'm not saying that we sit idly by and watch evil happen. I'm not saying we can't support systems of accountability in the secular world. But for you and I as Christians... As citizens of the kingdom of God, may we never forget that God alone is the judge. And God alone is able to dole out wrath and judgment and the such. And because his wrath comes in perfect judgment, perfect justice. Our ideas of judgment can be very easily distorted. What I think is right and wrong, as we've already mentioned, is very easy to be misunderstood or wrong or distorted. God's never is. And that's why we let him and him alone be the great judge. I hope that one sits with you for a little while and you continue to reflect on that throughout the week. So to return back to our main point, the wrath of God is being revealed. But why? Why did Paul say? Because people have turned away from God and they have no excuse. Let me just remind you of verse 20 that we read. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen without being, uh, excuse me, have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Now remember, in the Roman church, Paul is writing to a mixture of both Jews and Gentiles who have decided to follow Christ. Now the Jews knew God, and they knew what God wanted, right? They had the law. They had Moses. They had the prophets. So they definitely had no excuse. But what about the rest of the world? What about these Greeks, these Romans, these Gentiles who who didn't have that background, how should they have known about God or what God wants? And Paul says that the evidence is all around them. You know, the beauty of a fresh slate of snow that we got to enjoy this weekend. You know, a rose in bloom, the birth of a, a new baby, the mysterious, the mysterious dance of a, of a flame, the strength of a river. You know, it all points us to a creator. Now, modern day science might take a bit of the mystery out of uh, the world, but it by no means takes any of the witness out of the world, right? You may be able to describe gravity, atmospheric pressure, natural selection, or, or whatever, 
But now you also have the details of the tiniest intricacies of the single cell that points to a creator. Now we also know the vastness of the universe which points us to a creator. You know, our God has not hidden himself by any means. You know, in the words of the songs that our kids are very possibly singing downstairs, God's fingerprints are everywhere just to show us how much he cares. In the middle, he had lots of fun, made a hippo. We had the time. A hippo is witness to the, the, the creator. I had a friend in college who would always say, um, chocolate milk is proof that there is a God and that he loves us. I always, <laughs> always really liked that line. Or from the words of the songs that our kids sing at camp and the, that they sing in other places as well. Every time I watch a storm, I see the awesome power of my Lord. Every time I, I see a child, I know the gentleness of my Lord. God has given us the foundations and everything we need to know who he is and to praise him no matter what. And that's why Paul says that these humans, regardless if they were Jew or Gentile, they had no excuse. Because what did humans do? Instead of using the beauty of the world to focus on God and to praise him, they start praising the stuff, the stuff he made. Cows got turned into gods and the human which was meant to mediate God's presence to the creation, as we read about in Genesis a few weeks ago, ends up making the creation our master. Instead of being the sub-rulers of God over the creation, we elevate the creation to being our gods. And Paul says, how ridiculous is that? As you heard me say, this, this idolatry, which is exactly what I'm talking about, this idolatry, even though that's the way we see it and we think of it as these golden calves in these olden times, Idolatry is not just a bunch of golden calves, right? We still have idols in our culture and our lives today. We still idolize created things today. They're, not, they're just more subtle. You know, our, our idols today, money, sex, status, power, and the like, those are still created things that we turn into gods in our own life. And that's exactly what Paul refers to next in Romans chapter 1. He writes, therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Oh, there we go. Losing it. Because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. So, let me just say, normally, I think these delicate conversations are best had on a much more personal level, uh, where we can have a relation and a conversation uh, than through a lecture to a crowd. But as I said earlier today, this is part of preaching the whole of Scripture, right? This is part of preaching the whole Bible and not picking and choosing what we want to talk about. These issues are addressed by Paul for our guidance. And, you know, I do think this passage specifically in Romans chapter 1 is the most pertinent one for the entire topic of homosexuality in the Bible, okay? It's easy to brush aside the Levitical laws as being in the Old Testament. There's a lot of the Leviticus laws that we don't participate in today. Or we can ignore uh, this listed in in a big list of sexual immorality as being contextual, you know, but Paul speaks about this in depth here, and I I just, I don't think there's any way around it, what he's saying here in Romans chapter 1. Now, let me just say, I I have read the arguments. I have put in the time to study the the different arguments for why Paul might not be saying what he sounds like he's saying here. You know, I've read about how maybe the Greek word here might have been mistranslated. I've read the arguments about how this might be addressing homosexual pedophilia, not consenting adults, or how this doesn't have in mind actual monogamous relationships in general. You know, and I'd like to think I did those studies with an open mind, truly wanting to understand what Paul is saying. And if I was misunderstanding Paul, I I wanted to know that. But at the end of the day, I didn't personally find any of those arguments convincing. I, you know, I really do think we have to take this passage at its face value for what it is telling us. And that's not going to be popular in our modern world, but it's still worth standing by our convictions, isn't it? You know? and, and it's important. Paul gives it to us in the scriptures for a reason. With that said, 
It is equally important to note that this block of scripture that we're working through this morning, it's not simply a rambling about the sin of homosexuality. That's not the main point, okay? Paul is simply listing this as one example of the idolatry in our lives. And he has a lot more to say about this than just homosexuality. We continue on. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they would do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, and no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. That's a heavy line for me. Also approve of those who practice them. Okay, <clears throat> so I, I, we continue on, and when we continue reading, you know, it's easy for us to point out and point to homosexual verses and condemn others, right? It's very easy to just stop where I had read before and point to other people and condemn them. But don't forget, we have to keep reading. We have to finish the chapter. And when we, dis- when we do, we discover that right alongside homosexuality is gossipers, the deceitful, the envious, the boastful, those who disobey their parents. Uh-oh, right? <laughs> you know, Paul, Paul, and I think intentionally here, paints with such broad strokes that no one can escape, all right? No one gets to escape. And that's the point. That is the point. You know, Paul is going to write down just a couple chapter later, chapters later that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This isn't about the worst of the worst in this world that we think deserve God's wrath, okay? This isn't just about those who have more taboo sins that, that, that we recognize and point out more often. This is about you. This is about you. It's about you and me and how each and every one of us has departed from the good and faithful path that God has laid before us. How each and every one of us has chosen to live in the moment of our pain and darkness instead of with God and in his glory. It's about how God gave us what we needed for full and abundant life, but we rejected it and chose death instead. And this is the truth that we got to endure through every single day. Right? You know, We may put on blinders and forget about it from time to time, try to ignore the fact that we live in sin and deserve death. We may try to fill out our days with more good things than bad things and make ourselves feel a little bit better. But the truth is that we have already gone down this path of pain. We've already gone down a path that has departed from God's will and God's ways and God's full and abundant life. We have already chosen the way of sin, pain, darkness, and death. And not only that, but we've heard others along the way. Part of being on that path is throwing stones at other people, right? We have hurt other people out of our own hurt. There's not a single person here who has not hurt someone else out of the pains and the roots and the cracks in your own life. And thus, because of all this, we, we, you and I, have incurred the just, the just judgment of God upon ourselves. Isn't that true? It's part of what it means to be a Christian is that we believe that. It's not comfortable. It's not fun. I told you to get your Hellfire and Brimstone sermon one day. This is close, okay? This is, this is where we all are. We want to put on the blinders. We want to do more good than bad. We show up and we tithe our 10% and we pretend like everything's good. And everything is good because of what Christ has done for us. Because Romans goes on to remind us that there is one who was not like us who did not live for self, but who lived for God. And in his perfection, he willingly, willingly bore the wrath of God's judgment, took it all on himself so that we could in part live in his innocence. Yes, we do all deserve judgment, but Jesus took our place in punishment and offered us a clean slate and a newness of life, free, free from the shackles of our sins. He, and he alone, is the light that cast out all darkness. The question now is, was, will you accept that free gift? Will you accept it? Jesus already paid the price. It is paid in full. But will you take that new and that free life that he offers you today? 
If you'd like to make that decision of baptism this morning, or you'd simply like the prayers of the church as you continue to pursue life in his footsteps, the moment is available for you to come as we stand and as we sing.